Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today, we're very lucky to be joined by Carl Adji, who's come across to us from the University of New Mexico, where he's uh, the director of the Institute of Meteoritics and the meteorite curator uh, in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of New Mexico. Uh, Carl uh, did his PhD uh, at Columbia University uh, and, um, and has also worked at Johnson Space Center in the uh, curating facility there uh, and uh, in two, uh, following his uh, time at Johnson uh, he then moved across to University of uh, New Mexico. Uh, his research interests are on uh, origin and evolution of planetary interiors uh, and uh, using high pressure multi-anvil techniques and experimental petrology uh, in magma physics and uh, with an emphasis on the mobility of uh, silicate and metallic liquids and high pressure uh, under high pressure conditions. He's also interested in experimental trace elements, including uh, uh, partitioning in, uh, and uh, problems related to, to differentiation of the Earth's and terrestrial planets' interiors. And he's worked on uh, Apollo samples in that regard. Um, and uh, in uh, earlier this year, he uh, was the first author on a science paper on the topic of uh, NWA 7034 which is uh, the topic of tonight's talk, uh, a unique water-rich uh, Amazonian age uh, meteorite from Mars. So if you'll join me in welcoming Carl. Thanks for that uh, nice introduction, Adrian, and thanks for inviting me uh, to come to speak uh, in the seminar series. So, uh, and uh, yeah, so um, what I'm gonna be talking to you uh, about uh, this evening is uh, the meteorite shown in this picture. It's uh, NWA 7034, NWA stands for Northwest Africa. Um, it's a basaltic breccia. Um, it's a, this picture is of the, uh, the first of the uh, specimens of this particular meteorite that uh, was found. It's a, a single stone of 320 grams. It was found in Western Sahara in 2011. And what you're seeing there is the second saw cut that I took off of this meteorite because it actually sat on a shelf in my office for about a month because I didn't actually know what to do with it. It was a meteorite, <coughs> at least I thought it was a meteorite at the time, uh, that I had never uh, seen one like before. And so, uh, so I was, you know, I knew that I would needed to, to take some time uh, to figure out what this uh, specimen was all about. And so. Uh, Finally, I got the courage to cut, to slice into it, and uh, the, lo and behold, the interior was just absolutely amazing. So, and so that's the, uh, the talk uh, that I'm gonna be presenting uh, this evening. <clears throat> so from that time, uh, up until January of this year, so about more than a year, um, colleagues and I studied the, the, uh, the makeup of this meteorite, and um, Here's a list of authors on that science paper. And uh, we tackled this uh, meteorite with an array of uh, laboratory techniques to try to figure out what, what it was all about. And uh, I started off just first working on this with a, uh, an undergraduate student. And uh, we took it into the microprobe lab to, uh, to try to understand what was there. And, um, but then it, uh, we realized how complicated it was and we were going to need uh, a, a team of scientists to understand this. Um, here's a, a, uh, some better pictures of Northwest Africa 7034 and we call it Black Beauty. And Black Beauty is actually the name that this meteorite was given by the Moroccan dealer who sold it to an American meteorite collector who then sent it to me um, with the question of Carl, what is this? And so the name stuck because for one thing, people have a hard time remembering NWA 7034, and Black Beauty, everybody can understand and remember. Um, furthermore, it is a Black Beauty. It's a beautiful black meteorite, and when you saw it open, it's still black on the interior. It's shades of gray, and, and it has white, and it has meta uh, metallic-looking parts to it. You can see in this, in this photograph, in the lower right-hand corner, there, there's a thin section of uh, a piece of this meteorite, and that is, uh, uh, one of the ways in which you study these uh, objects is by looking at them in thin section. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, 
there are two, uh, two, uh, two more uh, black beauty specimens that were uh, recovered. And in the meantime, once it was realized that this is actually a really important Martian specimen, and furthermore, actually very valuable, um, the hunters, the Moroccan meteorite hunters, went back out to the place where the original one was found and found some more. And so right now, there, there's probably more than about a kilogram or so of, uh, of specimens um, that uh, have been recovered. Now, um, NWA 7034 is the first and only Martian breccia. And for those of you who don't know uh, geological rock terms, a breccia is a, essentially a collection of fragments that have been somehow put back together in, in uh, lithified and, and formed a rock. And, um, and you can see the, that uh, this, this Martian breccia is, in fact, uh, very heterogeneous. It's uh, got um, uh, a, a very complicated mix of minerals and actually rock fragments. Now, breccias are actually very common in meteorites. And the reason why they're common is because breccias also form not only from like terrestrial processes that we think of as you know, common geological processes, but also through um, meteor impacts. And so the, the, whole, uh, the whole process of impacting causes brecciation often. And we see that in uh, different types of meteorites, such as the one shown here. Uh, lunar, uh, this is a lunar feldspathic breccia, NWA 2995. Uh, on the right-hand side, that's a, that's a moon rock, a slice of a moon rock. And then on the left, there's a, a, a meteorite from the, what is thought to be from the um, parent body, the asteroid Vesta, a Howardite, which is also a breccia. So breccias are common in, in, uh, in meteorites, but, uh, but not for Martian meteorites. This is a uh, backscatter electron image of, um, of the basaltic breccia. And it, uh, I'm showing you this because it's uh, probably one of the more simpler textures that is found in this meteorite. Um, and this is how I started to, to try to figure out what, what this uh, rock was all about. I started off by just first looking at the dominant minerals present. And those are pyroxene and feldspar. And you can see that the pyroxenes are light colored in the backscatter electron image, and the feldspars are darker. And then you can see a very fine-grained background. And that's a, a mix of also feldspars and pyroxenes, but also bright specks in there, bright colored, um, even brighter than the pyroxene. And those are mostly iron oxides, mostly magnetite, hematite, and maghemite, and so on. Um, and uh, so I first tackled this rock thinking it was more or less a, an igneous rock. A, what I called it initially was a porphyry. A porphyry is a rock that, an igneous rock with large crystals, and then it has a fine ground, uh, fine ground mass. Um, but it turns out that this, this is much more complicated than a, than a basaltic porphyry. And I'm just going to run through a, a set of pictures, all backscatter electron images. And you can see the scale bar at the bottom. It's 100 microns. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so this is one of the textures that is common in the meteorite. It's, very, it's a very fine-grained, what's called a plumose structure. And um, this is often caused by rapid cooling of a liquid. So this is perhaps some sort of melt um, uh, pocket. Um, here's, again, another picture of, the, of these, what I initially thought were, um, uh, was a porphyritic texture. But you can see that most of the crystals in there are fragmental. They they're look like they've been broken in, in bits. And uh, so this is not a simple porphyry. Um, the meteorite also contains things that we still haven't figured out what they are. Um, we just uh, know that they're made up of a very complex uh, 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 intergrowth of things like pyroxene and, and uh, plagioclase, but also completely um, um, shot through with iron oxides. Uh, those are the bright. Uh, objects in the, uh, in the, in the uh, images. Here's another one, and another one, and yet another one. Okay, so these, these we haven't yet figured out, but we have, um, we have uh, um, a good idea about um, uh, many of the, of the components of this meteorite. And um, part of that job of just trying to get a handle on what is actually 
what, how did this form, where is it from, and so on, starts off with just simply um, working out what the mineralogy is. And right now, um, the tally is 18 mineral phases uh, present in this meteorite, dominated by plagioclase feldspar, alkali feldspar, pyroxenes, and then there are these iron titanium rich oxides which make up about 10% of the rock and are ubiquitous. Those are those bright things that sit everywhere. And they are magnetite, maghemite, hematite, ilmenite. And then there's a really interesting, very fine grained mineral phase called ferrihydrate that's present. And this actually holds most of the water that's present in this rock, which I'll get to in a minute. There's also chlori uh, chlorine rich apatite, chromite, pyrite, merylite, rutile, zircon. Zircon is very interesting, as you'll find out in a minute, not just because it's a common gemstone, but um, it actually tells us something about the age of this rock. Uh, uh, Betielite and, um, and olivine. Well, the thing that tipped me off initially uh, that this was uh, probably a, a rock from Mars is um, uh, because I because I just started off analyzing um, the, one of the dominant mineral phases present in the rock, namely the pyroxenes. And I collected um, hundreds of electron microprobe uh, uh, points of pyroxenes in the rock, just collecting data points, and then I plotted them up on the diagram <coughs> on, the, um, on the left. And uh, all of these blue dots uh, fell on this Mars line, which is uh, um, the uh, content of manganese versus iron uh, for Martian pyroxenes. And you can see that it is a bad match for, uh, the, um, for the, the, um, the pyroxenes for the moon. And also the pyroxenes from the Earth, they, are, they have a very short range on this diagram, and it's a poor match for that. So this got me thinking that this might have some affinity with Mars. To, uh, to, to delve into that further, I uh, 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 did the next step, which is nor normally done with Martian meteorites, and that is to uh, determine the oxygen isotope composition. And uh, when we uh, got the oxygen isotope data, which is shown in the, uh, the diagram on the right, um, the, the person who did the analyses, Zach Sharp at UNM, he said to me, Carl, he said, guess what? It's a meteorite. <laughs> I said, great. He said, but it's not Martian. Um, it, it doesn't uh, fall in the uh, array of Martian meteorites. And those are the red dots on that diagram. So it's offset. And, um, and actually um, saying it's not Martian, it has to be qualified with its they're not Martian, Martian meteorites. So the, S, the known SNC meteorites are a poor match for this particular rock. So that was a, that was a, a, a bit of a problem. And so uh, that, that got me uh, thinking about, well, what could it possibly be? And if you plot up um, all of the known achondrites, those are uh, igneous uh, formed uh, meteorites, and uh, you look at where they plot on the oxygen isotope diagram uh, that I show, that I have uh, displayed here, you can see that NWA 7034 has its own place on this diagram. No other achondrite uh, plots near NWA 7034. And uh, so, um, so clearly this uh, has something about it that no one's seen before. And, uh, and it might have a link to Mars, but we're not sure exactly what. Um, then we started to delve into the literature about um, oxygen isotope uh, compositions of Martian, um, of the Martian environment. And if you actually um, look at the, um, the values for the atmosphere of Mars, those all have higher oxygen isotope values than the SNC meteorites. So one way that uh, we could produce an oxygen isotope anomaly in, these, in, in Black Beauty is by having um, some sort of atmospheric interaction with uh, an SNC-like uh, rock. Um, in other words, have it altered. And so we think that part of the, um, the, the story here is that uh, NWA 7034 um, is not just a pristine basalt, not something that, that's from, let's say, a, 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 
an unweathered or uh, an unaffected um, basalt layer, which maybe some of the Martian meteorites are, but it is, in fact represents a surface or crustal material that has had a very um, uh, intense interaction with the surface environment on Mars. So this is, this is really exciting because this is uh, sort of what everyone's really interested in. You know, that's why we're going to Mars to look at the, the surface environment to see, you know, uh, what that's like. And, um, and the Martian meteorites are not necessarily sampling that, but this meteorite may have sampled that. Then what I did was um, I uh, took the bulk chemical analyses um, from all those electron microprobe um, points that we did, and I plotted them on this, uh, bus this uh, igneous rock diagram that um, shows um, the uh, SiO2 content versus the alkalized sodium and potassium. And um, you can see in the lower part of the diagram, the uh, SNC meteorites um, are, are, um, are uh, depleted in alkalis. And um, the Spirit rover data from Gusev Crater, this is the, one of the uh, Mars exploration rovers, um, the, the data from the basalts at the Gusev Crater plot are, are shown as the red dots. And uh, the average value of um, NWA 7034 is the, um, <coughs> the, the um, turquoise dot with the error bars. And so you can see that the, just from, this, uh, from these uh, alkalized versus SiO2, that the, um, the, the black beauty sample is in fact a better match for what the goose of uh, basalts are and what the rover, rovers have measured than uh, are the SNC meteorites. In the meantime, we've um, done more work on the meteorite, but also in the meantime, NASA has done more work on Mars. And um, so what we have now is not only um, basalts from Gusev Crater from the Mars Exploration Rovers, but we have MSL, Mars Science Lab. And uh, this is a slightly different uh, type of diagram than the one you just saw, but it's still, a, it's still an alkali versus silica diagram. And you can see, again, the, the SNCs are down low on the diagram. MSL um, ranges uh, over a wide range of alkali contents. Um, the MER basalts are right in the middle of the basalt field along with NWA 7034. And then I have the, the turquoise dots from NWA 7034, actually individual rocks or class that are in the meteorite. And they... Uh, most of them are basaltic, like MER, but some of them are also very rich in alkalis, um, just um, in, a, in a similar fashion to what MSL is seeing. Let me tell you a few more things about NWA 7034 um, and how it compares with other, uh, with other Martian meteorites. Um, as far as the, the rare earth elements go, um, they show that NWA 7034 is uh, the most um, geochemically enriched um, Martian rock. And uh, what I mean by that is it's been processed more um, in its formation. Just like on Earth when you have continental crust form, uh, uh, that, that's a, a, an enriched geo, uh, geochemical um, reservoir in the, in the Earth. And um, it's, it's caused by... Um, uh, multiple stages of, of uh, igneous differentiation. So NWA 7034 is truly a crustal rock from Mars uh, compared to other Martian samples like Shergati and Tissant and Nakla, which are um, depleted in uh, or lower in rare earth elements. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about how old this rock is. The, um, the first data set that we produced and the one that got published in our science paper was really exciting and it was done using rubidium strontium uh, age dating. And uh, we found that uh, the bulk rock uh, has a formation age of um, around 2.1 billion years. And um, that places it in the Martian geologic time scale of the, um, in the early Amazonian epoch. Um, there are other uh, radiometric dating methods that are used. 
And an, another one that's very commonly used is the Samarium neodymium uh, uh, system. And uh, for our uh, science paper, we, we didn't have uh, good enough data for it to be published. We actually, we did mention the, some of the values we had, but it wasn't really what we were hinging our story on. In the meantime, I've been collaborating with Larry Nyquist at Johnson Space Center, and they have now come uh, back with a really nice uh, Samarium neodymium uh, age of 4.4 uh, billion years for the formation of uh, NWA 7034, um, which places it in the early Noachian. And so you may say, well, that's strange because those are off by, that's off by a factor of two from their first age. Well, I think what, what's going on here is that we're looking at a, a very complicated rock that is not just one rock, but it is several rocks at least. And uh, the age that you get may be depend, depend on what part of the rock you're actually measuring. And so to delve into that further, we've now taken um, thin sections and we've done a map them completely. And this is just a false color um, um, uh, thin section of a backscatter electron image. And you can see uh, there are different amounts of major elements like magnesium, calcium, and potassium here. In fact, up at the top you can see here this, this is a very potassium rich Last, very, very alkali rich, totally different from the other part of the, of the thin section. But also within this thin section, it, it's subtle, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's right in here. There's this area in here that's a little different from over here. The color is slightly, slightly different, a little more blue than red. And that means that it's probably a different rock. And so, uh, and again, the scale here, you can see up in the, up in the uh, top corner there, uh, that's the thin section I'm holding in my, between my thumb and forefinger. That's an inch across. Okay, so what we did was we went in and looked for zircons in this thin section, and we found quite a few. And the, the beautiful thing about zircons is that you can do uranium lead dating on them, and you can do them on individual grains. So you go in with an, an ion probe, and you can get the age date on a single grain. In fact, a single grain can produce multiple dates even. So you can get dates from the core, from the rim. You can do a profile of dates. So this is actually a beautiful way to study a breccia because a breccia, you know, if you just grind it up and you get a bulk, sam uh, a bulk composition, uh, that's, yeah, that's a good average value, but it doesn't tell you actually much detail. And so what, does, what do the zircons tell us? Well, the zircons tell us at least in this one thin section, okay, again, this is one, uh, just a one inch piece of a uh, slice of that rock. And again, there are several of these specimens. So we're eagerly w waiting on going and looking at more of these. We've already found two distinct ages uh, or two populations of zircons. There is a young zircon population of 1.5 billion years old. And then there is another population 4.4 billion years old. And the, it's a little, maybe a little difficult to see um, in the slide here, but this, this central, this, this slightly darker uh, region in here has most of the young zircons. And then this background or the larger um, matrix part of the section has the ancient uh, zircons around 4.3 or 4.4 billion years old. So what so how we interpret this is that we have two rocks, one that formed uh, at 4.4 billion years ago on Mars in the early Noachian. We have another rock in there that formed 1.5 billion years ago in the Amazonian. And at some point after 1.5 billion years ago, they came together and were, form and were made part of the same rock. So, so what's really interesting about this, just again, even after having studied this rock for and, and had this team working on it for more than a year, we're now into the second stage and we're finding even more secrets and interesting things about it. We're, what's going on with this sample is that we have a, a time span now that, that, at least in this one thin section, spans about, um, well, nearly three billion years of Martian history. And this is a, a, a diagram just showing 
the ages of Martian meteorites, uh, summarizing uh, some of the notable ones. They're the Shergatites, uh, with Shergati being the, the, uh, the type specimen shown in red. Those are all less than a billion years old. Then you have the Noclites that are about 1, 1.2, 1.3 billion years old. And then you have NWA 7034 that has these different ages because it's actually more than one rock type. And then, of course, there's Allen Hill's 84001 that's 4.5 billion years. And here's just a, uh, another way to display this. Um, here we're looking at a, actually, this is derived from crater counting, uh, but it is uh, sort of shows here, displays the, um, the, the Martian geologic epochs, the Noachian, uh, the Hesperian, and the Amazonian. And you can see that, that uh, the zircons uh, the young zircons plot here in the, the middle of the Amazonian. Um, the rubidium strontium age is early Amazonian. And then we have old zircons and Larry Nyquist samarium neodymium age back here in the ancient early part of Martian history, the early Noachian. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the water that we found in, um, in NWA 7034. Um, this, this was something that was really exciting when, as we were watching it actually, um, uh, as, as the analyses were being done in the lab. Uh, I remember the day when we first started doing this and we started getting the data out, it was just, we were, it was very exciting, mainly because um, we were seeing um, levels of extraterrestrial water being uh, evolved out of this rock in the laboratory that were, um, 10 to 30 times higher than, than uh, have ever been measured in a Martian meteorite. Um, this, this sample has uh, up to 6,000 parts per million indigenous Martian water. And the way that we determined that was by stepwise heating and doing deuterium hydrogen analyses uh, simultaneously. So what, what you're seeing in these graphs are um, the release of, of water and then the measurement of the deuterium hydrogen um, ratio um, as a, again as a function of temperature done at different steps and you can see that the water uh, let's see if I can get this pointer to work here the water uh, this is the water uh, abundance and you can see that there's a peak around 300 to 400 degrees so that's when most of the water is being released out of the ferry hydrite and uh, then it then it drops off uh, to lower levels as, as the stepped heating uh, uh, progresses. This is just another sample, another run, where we um, also again see a maximum at around three to four hundred degrees, and you can see that the deuterium hydrogen values increase with increasing um, uh, temperatures. And again, these all these positive values for the deuterium hydrogen um, point to an extraterrestrial um, origin and not terrestrial water. We also looked at uh, the isotopic, uh, the oxygen isotopic composition of the evolved water um, to, um, as, a, as another way of trying to understand what, what its nature is. And um, this work was done at UC San Diego in Mark Thiemann's lab. And the interesting thing about the, um, the water that was uh, extracted from NWA 7034 uh, stepwise was that the um, that the, the oxygen isotopes, remember we, when we were surprised that the oxygen isotopes of NWA 7034 bulk, uh, that they were anomalous or higher than SNC meteorites? Well, interestingly enough, the water uh, values actually are the, more or less the same as SNC meteorites. So that was, that was a, a, a big surprise. And down below here, this line is um, the, uh, this is the value for, um, for oxygen on Earth. That's the baseline. So what is the origin of the water locked away in uh, NWA 7034? Well, we still don't really know, but we can start to guess about what possible conditions could have existed on Mars to produce this. One possibility is that all of this is impact-induced, that that impacts of the heat source and that, um, that water is freed up and, and allowed to circulate with the, the, the surface rocks um, th 
through this heating of, of, uh, of a cryosphere. Um, the other possibility is that it's hydrothermal and that the heating uh, comes from uh, essentially a magma body um, and that, again, a cryosphere is melted, interacts with the Martian crust, forms this uh, hydrated uh, rock like Black Beauty, uh, forming those very hydrate minerals. Um, another possibility is that there was standing water on the surface of Mars <laughs> at some point in time. Um, and, you know, when we first thought that this rock was from 2.1 billion years ago, the early Amazonian, that was a bit of a stretch. I mean, um, it's commonly thought that Mars by 2.1 billion years ago was already dry and already um, uh, pretty, uh, uh, with, with a very meager atmosphere and so on. But the, but the Noachian, you know, that's, that's possibly when Mars was warmer and wetter. Um, so again, one of the possibilities is that this is the result of standing water on the surface of Mars, some interaction with this rock and, uh, and, uh, and a body of water. Um, I just wanted to uh, highlight a couple of other studies that have come out in the meantime since our paper. One of them is that we've um, extracted Martian atmosphere out of the sample. And this, the Martian atmosphere is um, our noble gases. This is done by Julia Cartwright when she was at Max Planck Institute in Germany. And uh, she found that the argon data for NWA 7034 is striking in that it shows argon 4036 ratios approaching 3,000 at the 1,000 at degree step. This is a value very similar to the Martian atmosphere that was measured by uh, the Viking uh, probes back in the 1970s. And also the xenon uh, um, uh, values are, are uh, similar to the Martian atmosphere. Uh, when did this sample get blasted off of Mars? Uh, its ejection uh, from Mars took place somewhere between 5 and 11 million years ago. And that has been derived from cosmic ray exposure age uh, analyses also by Julia Cartwright. And um, again, this, this range still needs to be narrowed down, but this is the first cut. It, it's a, it's a, um, uh, a range of, of ages that, is, uh, that were um, uh, based on various models. And then finally, uh, again, another uh, uh, study that um, still uh, need, uh, is going to be published in the near future has to do uh, with um, the magnetic properties of this meteorite. Um, as I told you before, NWA 7034 is loaded with magnetite. All of those little grains are mag magnetites or they're mag uh, titanomagnetites and some of them have been altered to hematite. Um, and uh, so uh, the question is, is this lithology a good lithology for producing Mars magnetic anomalies. And uh, according to Rochette et al., um, it's an excellent match. Uh, they found that the significant magnet, magnetic fields over, um, over part of the Noachian crust at satellite altitude that have been documented by the Mars Global Surveyor mission um, require um, remnant magnetizations uh, up to 15 to 30 uh, amp meters over a crustal thickness of about 20, 20 to 50 kilometers. And they looked at Martian meteorites to see if they had those properties. And they found that very few Martian meteorites can, can offer that. And in fact, that, that dashed line on the graph on the right is the cutoff. And everything below that cutoff doesn't work. And there's just one, sam one or two samples that just barely make it NWA 7034 is that red dot at the top. And it, ha it shows nine times larger IRM than uh, above this threshold. And so you only need a few kilometers of this material to actually account for the observed magnetic fields. And uh, so this is a, another exciting aspect of, of this meteorite. OK, so what exactly is black beauty? Um, we know that it is Martian, uh, but what kind of Martian? And this is part of the ongoing research right now that we're going to try to uh, uh, try to understand better. Is it a volcanic breccia? Is it an airfall ash? Is it a pyroclastic flow? Is it an impact breccia? We think right now, actually, this, this is basically a sedimentary rock. It's a conglomerate. And it may have bits of all of these things um, wrapped up in it. Uh, dust, soil, spherules, and basaltic pebbles. 
Um, what you see in the, um, in the picture of the, in the top there is a, um, a slice of um, NWRA 7034. Scale bar is one centimeter. And um, I've highlighted these spherules that are everywhere in this meteorite. And um, they come in all, they come in a wide range of uh, sizes. They're down to just a few tens of microns, up to hundreds of microns, up to sometimes centimeter scale. And they're very complicated. I showed you some of, the, some of these in the earlier pictures. Uh, down below, we have some that are just highlighted for um, particular elements like sodium and iron and so on. And so luckily, I mean, in addition to that, that original sample that I, that I was started working on, there are, there are uh, other recovered samples. And uh, so I'm be I've been working with uh, some collectors who have these samples, who've acquired them. And we're going to be looking at uh, uh, many of them. And, um, but it's really, it's really um, a problem when you start cutting a meteorite up. It's an irreversible act, OK? Once you've sliced that meteorite open, you find something beautiful, but then you say, I want to slice another piece off, and another piece. Especially when it's a breccia like this, and, you, and every single slice is different than the one that came before. Um, so, um, so instead of going in and slicing all these up, and then we'll say, oh, well, we don't have any of these whole rocks anymore you know, for f future generations. What we decided to do is to use tomography to try to get a handle on what is going on inside of these rocks before we cut them up. But in addition to that, this is a great way to do reconnaissance on the samples to actually look at the geochemistry of the interior of the rock using tomographic methods. And so I've teamed up with Doug Rowland at UC Davis who basically does most of his tomography on living things, you know, not on rocks. I mean, the advantage of doing tomography on a meteorite is that it doesn't move when you're doing a CAT scan on it. And so, uh, and you can also leave it in there all day, <laughs> and it doesn't complain. Um, so uh, Doug put together this graphic. This is a combined X-ray and neutron scan. So the first, we'll see part of the, part of the movie is going to be showing us the features that x-rays show us. And that's very similar to what the backscatter electron images from the electron probe show us. And they ba basically what they are are chemical maps. So let's, let's roll the movie. OK, let's see here. There we go. Oops, come on. Oh, come on. There we go. So the first picture. What we're seeing right now is just the volume of the, of the sample. This is a 240 gram stone. This requires a huge amount of instrument time, by the way, to do a big stone like this. And um, the voxel size is fairly coarse. It's 42 microns. Um, so think of that as a pixel, I guess, except that it's a volume. And so this is just giving us the shape of the meteorite. And then at some point, um, uh, we decide to start doing interior imaging. So what we're seeing now is the interior revealed. And what Doug has done here is he's just pulled up the high Z element minerals. And Z meaning atomic number. So things like that are enriched in iron show up as like a green. Things that are less iron rich are blue. And things that have no iron in them are transparent. And now we're doing slices into the meteorite. And these are, these are like the backscatter electron images, except that they're uh, an infinite number of slices. And now you can see the spheres start to appear here and there. And if you sit and, look and go run this movie over and over again, you see something new every time you, you look at it. But you can see bigger class. You can, you can see some of the prominent sphere. There's a couple of spheres appearing. And now it's going to come back at us again. And this time, we're looking at neutrons. So this is the neutron interaction with the meteorite, not x-rays. And neutrons show us other uh, elements. And in fact, the things that are reddish in here, um, are, we still have to confirm that. But they are probably more water rich than the, the parts that are poor in reds and are more blue and more green. Uh, so we're thinking of using this technique also to uh, pick out parts of the meteorite that might have more water in them than others 
and look at the parts that are dry. You can also use tomography targeted. So this is a fairly coarse, this is a you know, sample that you can hold in your hand about this big. Uh, and you know, making a, a movie like this is very time consuming and costly. But once you see something interesting, then you can say, okay, let's target it. And so that's what the next one is. This is a targeted scan. And now we've not, we're not doing neutrons, we're just x-rays in this one. And this fragment is only 0.5 grams. So this is a tiny little piece. But look at the voxel size, 2.2 microns. So now we're going to see lots of detail. And this is when it gets really interesting. I wish we had this for the 240 gram one, but that would take months to do probably. So I picked this one out because it has a big sphere in it. And I wanted to highlight and study the sphere. So you can see the sphere. And there is giving the Z, or the, giving us what, where the, the iron rich parts are and the parts that are intermediate in iron. So the sphere is actually intermediate in iron. And there is the sphere in X-ray backscatter. And you can see it's got, it's got a rim around it. It's very complicated mineralogy. We were seeing that also in the, in the 2D images before, but here seeing it in three dimensions is just, you know, it really uh, opens your mind much more to what the thing is, is uh, about spatially. And so then the next thing to do, what we're going to do is probably go in and extract this sphere, maybe do age dating on it, um, tease it apart, try to understand all the, the, the complexity that is there. Okay. So now we're, get, we're getting towards the end of the talk. And um, what I wanted to show you is um, uh, a uh, little YouTube clip uh, produced by UNM about the study. And it highlights some of my coworkers in this. And also, if you, um, if you didn't understand what I told you <laughs> over the last, last uh, uh, 30 or 40 minutes, this is a summary of the talk. So, so this is a, so, uh, so if I miss something that maybe it will, um, we'll be able to recover here. So let me just. Uh, that's right, absolutely. This is by far and away my favorite rock. Uh, the, this, this thing has uh, amazing secrets about Mars hidden away in it. This little rock may be a once in a lifetime discovery for researchers at the University of New Mexico. Carl Agee, and director and curator of it, UNM's it Institute of Meteoritics, led the team that identified NWA 7034 as a new class of Martian meteorite. Well, I see a lot of meteorites. And this one was different from any meteorite I'd ever seen before. Found in the Sahara Desert in 2011 by a nomad, the meteorite was sold to a dealer and then to a collector who sent it to UNM for analysis. A.G. and his colleagues have spent more than a year unlocking some of the mysteries contained in the rock they affectionately call Black Beauty. Putting together the different pieces, the mineralogy, the chemistry of the rock, the chemistry of the minerals, together with the um, oxygen isotopic composition, the hydrogen isotopic composition, we knew it, it has to be Mars. This is the kind of discovery that excites even sophisticated scientists. It's cool. It's, uh, it's kind of, you're standing there.
things that have been done with zircons on uh, on terrestrial rocks are pretty incredible, like inf inferring oceans during the Hadean period and stuff like that. Um, yeah, do you care to um, hazard any suggestions on the further uh, what we can get out of the zircons that are trapped in Black Beauty at the moment? Yeah, they're they're um, the what the. There are uh, things called detrital zircons that are um, things that end up in sediments. And so the original rock uh, from which they were derived is no longer in existence. Those are, those are like the oldest zircons on Earth. Um, what we're trying to do with Black Beauty is we're trying to understand um, if there are any detrital zircons and are there some zircons that are clearly part of a, um, a, real, a, a rock from which they, uh, in which they formed. So we're going to be looking at gabbros um, that have zircons and finding what their ages are. So there could be some of these could be detrital. Um, it's really hard to say at this point. Um, it's it's uh, very exciting. And in, in addition to the zircons, there are also appetites, and we're just starting to da to date the appetites as well. And um, it appears as if there may be yet another population of ages. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but this is the first thin section that we've studied. And so this being a breccia, um, uh, I think we're going to be busy working on this for a while, trying to, to, to work out those ages. But it's clearly the most exciting part right now. Um, the age of the process, which put this breccia together, has to be younger than the youngest bit of it. Yes. And you speculated it's sedimentary. Some bits of it are well under, or under or well, or, or I forget if they're well under two billion, or but they're under two billion. Yeah. Which so whatever sedimentary process we're thinking about, it's almost it's unlikely to be aqueous, like aeolian or something well, like that, right? It could be impact, you know, and then it even impacts on recent Mars or you know Mars of a billion years ago could still generate um, a, a a local hydrothermal system. You know, the heat release and an impact can melt the cryosphere. So I'm not ruling that out um, at all. And I think we still need to keep our minds open about when Mars actually became. But, but you're actually going to sediment it. No. Trans yeah. If you're actually going to sediment it, you need transport. The impact impact processes could end up putting it all back together. And there, could be, there could be also conglomerates or uh, breccias within breccias. Um, it, it could be that complex. We see this on the moon, for example, where there's no water. Uh, you see uh, welded breccias. Um, so, so maybe the last bre maybe the last lithification was an impact, uh, but it doesn't rule out that there were earlier um, conglomerates that formed. Okay, uh, my question was kind of similar. Would you be able to measure strontium isotope ratios from the impact site? as well as with the rocks that, uh, that you already did, and try to compare whether or not the water source was from the impact or whether it was previous. I mean, I, ideally, what we would love to have are in situ samples on Mars. You know, that's the whole point of Mars sample return. Right. Is to go and, like with Apollo, we went to particular places, we brought the rock back, we age dated it, and we know that that rock is from that place on the moon, and it's exactly that old. Right. That's what we don't have for Mars right now, and that's, I think, one of our important long-term goals for Mars to okay. do that. So, and yeah, we can do it. I mean, it, it just needs, we just need, you need to have ground truth on Mars, essentially. If I um, heard you correctly, the, the oxygen 17, oxygen 18 ratio for NWA 7034 is a little bit higher than most Martian meteorites. It but is. I, th I think you said the water, the uh, oxygen 17 18 ratio for the water in this meteorite was actually on par with what you expect from Martian meteorites. So that means something else in the meteorite is actually elevated then. Do you know, is it everything or are there certain pieces? Or We don't know the answer to that. Okay. We've been looking for that elusive, really high value. It could be something that is um, something we can't separate out. Um, so I don't know the answer to the question. I that wish could I be did. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. We have in the meantime, Karen Ziegler has gone in and, and done mineral separates. So the, the, the graph I showed you is a little old. Um, 
and uh, she's found some uh, individual grains that are like SNC. And um, what we would love to do is to take this rock, and we're going to do this, and we're going to go in it with like um, a focused ion beam and actually carve out chunks of individual minerals and get oxygen on them. Um, so, so not with a ion probe, but actually do um, uh, laser fluorination oxygen isotope analyses on little tiny pieces. And that way, I mean, that's a true mineral separate. So um, maybe it'll turn out that there are SNC components in there. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll also find that really high value somewhere. <laughs> We're still looking. Yeah. But yeah, you're, that's a good point. I yeah. wanted to ask about the pigeonite. Um, yeah. That it, it seems to be common. Uh, it, it's attributed to Mars, and it's found in a lot of meteorites. But they're difficult to find on Earth, like pure pigeonites, because uh -huh. they're usually sort of a blend. Uh -huh. Do you have any idea the pigeonites in this meteorite? Are they nice pure pigeonites, or are they the sort of typical blend that's found on Earth, too? <sighs> I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> they're, the, the trouble with this rock is the, the, you know, in the beginning it all looks sort of, do, you know, oh yeah, I sort of understand what's going on here. And the more you study it, the more complexity you see. And I tend to have fewer straightforward answers <laughs> like to that, so. I want to ask a question about the, uh, the water, too. You mentioned that it was associated with the ferrohydrites. Yes. And you found there was a lot of water by just, I assume, heating up the entire sample rather than just the ferrohydrates. Yes. Can you clarify that? Is, is the ferrohydrates that have all the water, is it the matrix that has the water? Where is the water associated with? It's, it's in that matrix, in that very fine-grained material for the most part. So why, why did you say that was the fire ferrohydrates? The, fer the ferrohydrite we've uh, detected using um, uh, X-ray diffraction techniques and uh, going in with a, uh, again, with a, um, uh, a type of a focused ion beam, and actually, or like with a TEM, and actually identifying what this very fine grain matrix is. It's really hard to, um, when it's you know, submicron, it's very difficult to, um, to, to uh, with an electron probe or something, to identify what it is. But that was one of our main goals, is to figure out where the water is. And we now believe that, that the water, because ferry hydrate has so much water in its crystal structure, and because there's now we think lots of it, even though it's very fine grain, that that is where the bulk of the water resides. Thank you. The other is mm -hmm. appetite. It's a, a second phase, but it's only minor, I think, in terms of the water uh, story. Is there anything from this that you can say about, uh, say, the, the, the orbital dynamics of this population of ejecta? Uh, sort of inter-rocky planets uh, uh, micro-transfer, in a sense? So you, do you mean like, um, is there something special about the ejection age, or? Well, we'll just say, uh, does, does our moon sweep a lot of it, for instance? Uh, what, are, what are transfer rates? If you can, you can speculate on that. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, there, Venusian to Mars and well, vice versa. Well, there's data on um, there's data on uh, ejection ages for Mars, and I, I wish I had the graph I could show you here, but um, it, it basically um, is composed of about maybe three or four, maybe at most a half a dozen ejection ages. So there look it looks as if on Mars at least we're sampling only a handful of impacts. Um, and they um, all happened within the last, let's say, 10 to 20 million years ago. Some of them, mo most of them more recent. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Well, maybe get, getting it done. When would you, pref when would, might you predict the first uh, Earth, Earth-derived meteorite to be found on Mars? Oh. Uh, so, so, just, just sort of balancing well, it. it's a good question. I mean, we, People are speculating not only about Earth and Mars, but we're all still looking for the first m meteorite from Venus or from Mercury. And it's more, you know, as I understand it, it's more difficult to get a, a meteorite off of, get a meteorite not only off of Mercury, it's not that difficult, but getting it to Earth right, because right. the sun is so close to yeah. Mercury. Um, Mars, on the other hand, well, we're on the right, we're on the favorable side of Mars because things, you know, tend to fall yes. into so the sun. So, so we're, we're getting uh, 
Martian meteorites. And of course, the lunar meteorites are a near neighbor. Um, so getting an Earth meteorite to Mars is going to be difficult because the Earth is interior to Mars in the solar system. And also, the Earth has a, is a larger gravity well. So, and it also has a thicker atmosphere. So all of those things will make it more difficult to, first of all, even get something off of the Earth. And then once you get it off of the Earth, um, to keep it from falling into the sun. Ultimately. And there, there's old stuff out there still, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, sure, there, there's the whole asteroid belt. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a hard question to answer. Not, not full of Martian meteorites. No, not full yeah. of Martian meteorites. Maybe, though, yeah. you never know. Yeah, expect surprises. I've, I've got a couple of related questions. Sure. Um, the fusion crust on this thing looks beautiful. You call yeah. it the Black Beauty. That's yeah. because it's so unweathered, it's yeah. so fresh. So, yeah. so I mean, you, you don't have a terrestrial age for it, but even if it's been on Earth a short time, it must have absorbed terrestrial water. Yeah. So my question is, um, ha have you detected that water with the techniques you've No, we using? haven't. No, what we have found is we found um, terrestrial carbonate, but it's a pretty dry, it's dry from a terrestrial perspective. It's not full of clearly um, hydrated terrestrial secondary minerals. The terrestrial mineralization in its place of origin in the Sahara Desert apparently produces this caliche, this uh, carbonate. Uh, and it really is a very dry meteorite in terms of terrestrial weathering. And we saw that, I don't know if I can bring this slide back up again, but um, let's see here, let me get out of this. Um, you know, when we looked at the, um, at the uh, oxygen isotope values for water, um, let's just back up here for a second. You see, even, um, even at the 50 degree step right here, that's, that's the water that came off at 50 degrees, um, way off of the terrestrial fractionation line, way above it. It's um, above 0.4. And we were, when I, when I saw that, I was blown away because I was expecting that to be terrestrial water, and it isn't. It's Martian water. It's, yeah, low, it's low temperature Martian water. The conventional wisdom is anything less than 100 degrees C is terrestrial. I know, but there you go. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we were looking also at the deuterium hydrogen. And so on this graph, you can see that, it, that the deuterium hydrogen increases with increasing temperature. And that's what people expected. We interpreted the, the first steps with negative D to H ratios to be terrestrial. But I'm not sure if we can even do that. I don't know if that's really true. And um, I'm not sure if we actually even really know what the Martian D to H ratio is. There could be a mantle D to H ratio. There could be a surface D to H ratio. There's a D to H ratio that people get from appetites that are it's very high, thousands. So it's you know it's still an open question, I think. But I think the oxygen, this oxygen plot, when I saw this from Mark Neiman's lab, I was just I, I was like, oh my gosh, all of this water is Martian. You know, it's not terrestrial. But I think to that end, right, this was a, a very fresh stone, so the amount of time it spent on Earth was very, very low. And if I remember correctly, the matrix is really, really dense. So oh, yes. in terms of any incursion of Earth water into it, that would have to be next to nothing, especially if it didn't spend very much time in the desert. Yeah. I mean, but, but, I, but where we do see the, the caliche, um, Derek, is in the, um, just in the cracks. You know, uh, most of them near the surface. And, it, you know, I think it's, it's a really interesting um, sort of area of study as to, um, I mean, people have worked on this, is uh, the type of terrestrial weathering in a particular area of, on Earth. Like in New Mexico, you see a type of weathering where, well, I've seen some from New Mexico that have lots of barite in them. And these have no barite in them. These are, cal those little caliches are all calcium carbonate. And, uh, you know, so I think it's depend, dependent on where, where they're found and where they've been lying on Earth. Well, that, that's for sure. 
Yeah. Um, weathering in the, in the Antarctic, I know from yeah. the stuff I've yeah. been doing, is yeah. very, very different yes. from the weathering in New, in New Mexico or yeah. in the prairie sure. states. Yeah. Um, but, okay, sep do, can I have a, sep another, a new yeah, question? Yeah, okay. okay. Um, and you, you, I was thinking of this frequently during your talk, and you must have thought of it too. You have a brescia, and you only have an inch uh, section, right? Well, so that we actually have about 12 thin sections. Okay, you have, okay, but, so you have, okay. So but this one we've studied uh, ad nauseum. My, my question <laughs> has more substance to it then, okay. Yeah. Is it possible to take the brescia apart and identify discreetly different lithographies? Yeah and then try and um, attribute some of these other data, like the isotopic data and, yeah. the, and the, the radiometric data, to a discrete lithology. This is my NASA proposal. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what's going to happen? I hope you get to review it. <laughs> OK, well, last, last question. I just want to ask if you saw any uh, olivine crystals or peridot or anything like that in the system. That we found some very small. Um, what we think are quench crystals that were olivines. Um, very isolated in one class. There are no, uh, no olivines in the rest of the rock. It's a pyroxene feldspar rock, basically. Yeah, with lots of magnetite. Mm. Uh, so, Carl, I have the um, ultimate lead in, of course. We're going to give you another Black Beauty. All right. To, uh, <laughs> to go along with your one kilogram. This is about, a, I don't know, half a kilogram sample there Fantastic. for you. A SETI mug. Please uh, join me in thanking Carl for his great talk. Thanks. Thank you. If you have any more questions, you can uh, come and talk to Carl.